item of business is members' business debate on motion 18154 in the name of Gordon MacDonald on 50 years of the Institute of Occupational Medicine. And this debate will be concluded without any questions being put. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons, please. And I call on Gordon MacDonald to open the debate for around seven minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I thank everyone from across the Chamber who supported this motion, allowing this debate to take place. I also welcome several members of the IOM team who are in the public gallery, including Rob Aitken, the CEO. It's a pleasure to be leading this members' debate, celebrating 50 years of the Institute of Occupational Medicine and their achievements over that time. It was founded in Edinburgh as an independent research organisation in 1969 by the National Coal Board, and based in the Rickerton Research Park in my constituency. Originally, IOM were established to complete groundbreaking research in lung disease in coal mine workers and their research has been critical in leading to the common understanding that coal mining not only caused the specific de disease pneumoconiosis, but also an increased risk of chronic obstructive lung disease among miners. Since then, IOM's work has progressed and expanded to understand and mitigate a range of occupational and environmental health risks. These include exposure to quartz and other dusts, asbestos, other fibrous materials, carbon nanotubes, ultraviolet radiation, air pollution, and physical and psychological stress. Presiding officer, IOM has made many achievements over the last 50 years, and I know I don't have the time to mention all of them. Nevertheless, I want to touch on a few accomplishments that stood out to me. They have been a leading player in Europe to collaborate research related to the safety of nanometers, nanomaterials such as emissions from welding and diesel engines. IOM's Centre of Excellence was one of the first recognised organisations developing the safe use of nanotechnology. IOM have also played an incredibly significant role in eradicating asbestos exposure across Europe. In 2006, teaming up with the EU's Senior Labour Inspector Committee, IOM created a European guide focused on asbestos for employers, employees and labour inspectors. This guide defined a set of practices to eradicate exposure within the workplace by focusing on identifying asbestos contaminated materials and engaging specialists to remove it. Unfortunately, this guide came too late for my late father, who died of lung cancer in 1990 at the age of 56. As a young man, he was a merchant seaman working in the engine room of the cargo ships. He maintained it wasn't smoking that was killing him, but his exposure to asbestos used for lagging pipes, a danger that was not known about in the 1950s or 60s. Presiding officer, IOM have also played an important role in improving the understanding surrounding environmental pollution globally, contributing to the Clean Air for Europe program a European Union funded review of air quality standards. Alongside AEA technology, IOM assessed the literature and offered its view on how many deaths and diseases in Europe may be caused by air pollution. Overall, the results from the Clean Air for Europe programme show that the health and environmental benefits of interventions to reduce pollution far outweighed the implementation's costs. This evidence-based assessment strengthened the negotiating position of those in the European Commission, the European Parli Parliament and the Member States who wanted better air quality and is subsequently better health throughout Europe. Presiding officer, bringing it up to date, it was a result of IOM investigations earlier this year that problems were identified with the ventilation system in the New Sick Kids Hospital here in Edinburgh. IOM are continuing to provide assistance to the commissioning team to facilitate improvements which will enable the hospital to open with a fully validated, safe and effective ventilation system. IOM is now one of the most successful organisations in EU flagship research programme Horizon 2020. Their role in Horizon 2020 has seen IOM leading or participating in 13 projects across topics 
including nanotechnology, chemical and environmental risks to health and their management. In terms of participation in these projects, IOM are the 12th most successful organisation in Scotland, and if you exclude universities, they are the fourth. To mark their 50th anniversary, IOM have worked with Innov Innovation Digital to create 50 pieces of unique digital artwork, which will be on display at the event in the garden lobby tonight. Each one of these large posters will illustrate one of the 50 most significant scientific impacts that IOM has made during the last half century. The poster campaign is aligned with our charitable aims, one of which is to lead the advancement of education in these fields. And it is with education in mind that one of the hopes for the campaign is that it will inspire the next generation of scientists. I know the Scottish Government and everyone across this chamber fully recognises our need to develop and grow Scotland's expertise in the interrelated fields of science, technology, engineering and mathematics. It is hoped that IOM's campaign can play a crucial role in promoting not only science, but science as a discipline in Scotland to today's young people. I very much welcome this focus from IOM to help drive forward improvements in STEM education and training in Scotland. Presiding officer, I've briefly outlined how a Scottish organisation based in Edinburgh has made such a difference to health outcomes across Europe and beyond. I would like to thank everyone who has been a part of IOM over the last 50 years for their hard work to create a healthy and sustainable world through outstanding independent science. Their research and other scientific work over the last 50 years has improved the health and safety of people at work, at home and in the environment. And I'll finish by urging everyone who's taking part in the debate tonight join the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills, John Swinney and I, at the event in the Garden Lobby. Thank you. Uh, can I ask Mr Macdonald's fan club in the public gallery, please, to refrain from clapping, booing or otherwise during the debate? Thank you. And uh, we'll now move to the open debate and speeches of four minutes, please. Alexander Stewart to be followed by Rona Mackay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am very pleased to take part in this members' business debate today, and I congratulate Gordon MacDonald on securing it. The Institute of Occupational Medicine, or IOM, is celebrating its 50th anniversary. It is one of our leading providers of workplace health research and consultancy services, and it is vitally important that it has the opportunity to extend its scientific and medical disciplines. Based here in Edinburgh at Heriot Watt University Research Park, they employ over 100 staff who help deliver safer working environments and healthier working lives for thousands of organisations and individuals across the world. As we've already heard, the National Coal Board founded the IOM in Edinburgh as an independent research organisation back in 1969, primarily to enable the research of lung disease in coal miners. Nowadays, the IOM advises, regulates, inspects and controls many areas of hazards in the workplace. These include Legionella risk assessment, asbestos and other fibres, workplace exposure limits, handheld vibration, dust and noise monitoring and many others and they also have the invaluable expert witness service that they provide. Deputy Presiding Officer, the IOM's excellent work as we know has been to understand and mitigate a meredith of ranges of occupation and emotional health risks. These include physical risks on health and additional, there is the psychological risks uh, that they also uh, participate in. The IOM has also been a leading light across Europe in collaboration with research related to the use of safety of nanotechnology. This technology has helped to shape many of the latest advances in medicines, in healthcare, in per personal cosmetics, in paints, in packaging and in 3D printing. The IOM's Safe Nano Centre of Excellence has, for the last 13 years, de-risked uh, the, 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 the technology and using a unique collaboration uh, of 
uh, lab laboratories and the, the state of the art equipment in collaboration uh, with expertise of small startups, but also working with national uh, companies in collaboration to ensure that that takes place. The Safe Nano work has also uh, ensured that the UK government, uh, in association with many of their agencies, the Health and Safety Executive, DEFRA, the Environmental Agency and Food Standards Agency, have all participated. Deputy Presiding Officer, much progress has been made on the impact of nanotechnology topics across many examples, uh, and there are individuals and organisations who are addressing the risks that, that are there and that have impacted on the workplace. However, there are still many examples where governments and industries have still to fully recognise the extent of risk and issues that are emerging from the technologies that we have to present. To this end, I commend and I congratulate the Institute of Occupational Medicine for their pioneering and innovative approaches in the research and effectiveness of governance across the, the technologies that they've been involved in. The current uh, and emerging technologies where as much uncertainty today as there was in the past, an organisation like this has ensured that it's pushed up the agenda and it is being tackled. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, the Institute has set a major milestone in its celebrating its 50 years of service. The organisation has achieved considerable amount of well-being for individuals and organisations across the years, and it's right that we recognise their achievements here this evening in this chamber. Their pioneering work has ensured that the organisation has gone from strength to strength, and I congratulate all who have contributed during the last 50 years, and I wish them well for the next 50 years. Thank you. I have Rona Mackay, followed by Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to speak in this debate and thank my colleague Gordon MacDonald for bringing it to the Chamber. Presiding Officer, at a time when our rights have never been more uncertain, and I mean employment rights, human rights and health and safety at work, there couldn't be a more, more need for a body such as the Institute of Occupational Medicine. The 50th anniversary is an important milestone in the Institute's history, as over the last half century, much scientific research has been undertaken to understand a whole range of occupational and environmental health risks. So much has changed in the last, last 50 years. We're living longer, thanks to amazing medical advances, but on the downside, we're witnessing devastating effects of local, global warming and climate change. The work that has been done and is being done, has been done and is being done by the IOM is truly science at work, tangible proof that science has made the world a safer place for us all to live and work. As we've heard throughout this year, the organisation celebrating our scientific, uh, scientific achievements and these are the impacts uh, these have had through a series of events, exhibitions and artwork throughout the UK and beyond. And there's much to celebrate, from groundbreaking work into asbestos, lung disorders from mining work, Legionella disease, hand-arm vibration, chemical risk, noise monitoring, and much, much more, many of um, which we've heard from the previous speakers. Presiding officer, I confess that I knew little of the amazing achievements this institute is responsible for until researching to speak in this debate. But isn't it always the way that the most important work, work which protects every one of us in some form or another, is done quietly in the background, safeguards that to some extent we all take for granted. And the work and the research never stops. It will go on protecting our children and our grandchildren as technology moves on at an eye-watering pace for generations to come. Presiding officer, I'm proud that the Institute's headquarters is located in Edinburgh in my colleague Gordon MacDonald's constituency. Scotland's capital city is a fitting place for this world-leading organisation to call home, and I know its global reputation enhances our country more than we will ever know. Sometimes it's good to stop and think about what's going on behind the scenes which protects us and enhances our environment, whether that's at work um, or in our day-to-day -day life. So can I thank the Institute of Occup Occupational Medicine um, for all its um, skill, um, research and uh, innovative, amazing work. And I'd like to wish everyone involved a very happy 50th anniversary. Thank you. Monica Lennon, followed by Claire Adams. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you to Gordon MacDonald for lodging this motion for debate and for an excellent speech. He's clearly very proud as a constituency MSP to have the Institute of 
occupational medicine based in his constituency. And although there's so many achievements to cover, I think he did do justice to uh, the Institute t tonight. Um, unfortunately, I'm unable to stay for the, the full debate uh, tonight and for the reception, which I'm sorry to miss out on. And I'd like to pass on my best wish, uh, the best wishes of David Stewart, MSP, who had hoped to speak tonight, but he's unwell. But my colleague, Lewis MacDonald, is here, um, who is the convener of the Health and Sport Committee in Parliament and will be at the reception to join the celebrations tonight. Um, from its origins, as we've heard, in the late 1960s, as an organisation that was primarily designed to research lung disease in mine workers, the work of the Institute um, in continuing to inform us of the risks faced by workers and the increasing need for rights of people in the workplace remains crucial. And a Scottish Labour health spokesperson and an MSP for Central Scotland region, representing many former mining communities, I know well the legacy of industrial respiratory illness. And I thank Gordon MacDonald for speaking about his father's experience I've recently been appointed as the Parliamentary Pulmonary Rehab Champion by the British Lung Foundation. So I'm all too aware of the work that needs to be done in terms of improving treatment for lung health and improving the availability of pulmonary rehab and other treatments for those with lung disease. So that is equally accessible across the country. But whilst it's right to focus on access to treatment, I believe that much more focus has to be given to the prevention of illnesses in the first place. And that's where the research of the Institute comes in and is so vital. In terms of increasing our understanding of occupational and environmental health risks for workers, such as asbestos and other hazards which can affect workers. But I think as both Gordon MacDonald and Rona Mackay have set out, you know, there's a global context here that, that we in Parliament are alive too, but I think we have to, to wake up to, to the challenges um, that, that don't have borders. And the motion, I think, does touch on the need for um, creating a healthy and sustainable world. And we all have to play our part in that, alongside the, the Institute. Um, I am the daughter of a health and safety officer. Um, so I'm well acquainted with some of the, 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 the themes that we've touched on tonight and the importance of health and safety in the workplace. But like Rona Mackay, I didn't know a great deal about the, the Institute. But that's the great thing about members' debate is that we come here and it's a bit of a classroom. We can all learn from each other and each other's passions. And lung disease has been uh, an issue in, in our family too. Um, workplace related, my gran uh, was a, a barmaid for most of her working life and, and she died um, because of lung cancer. She was a smoker herself, but I think smoking in the, the workplace certainly had a big part to play in that. And thankfully, in this place, we've, we've passed legislation um, that has, has addressed that. But we absolutely need the scientific research and understanding of potential hazards. And I would say we also need the presence of strong trade unions in the workplace who can advocate for workers and ensure they're getting fairly treated. And Rodan Mackay began by talking about rights and people need to know what their rights are um, and when they're being breached. We may no longer have coal, worker, coal miners working in Scotland, but the work of the IOM remains just as relevant today as it did 50 years ago. Everyone has the right to be safe whilst they're doing their job. So in conclusion, presiding officer, I reiterate my thanks and congratulations to the Institute of Occupational Medicine for the work that they do and have done over the past 50 years. And I wish everyone at IOM well for the future. Thank you. Claire Adamson, followed by Annie Wells. Hey, can I, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I also thank my colleague Gordon MacDonald for bringing this mo motion for debate to the Parliament this evening and echo the comments of um, my colleagues in the Chamber that I really didn't understand the extent and of the work of the Institute of Occupational Medicine until researching for tonight's debate. As the member for Motherwell and Wisha uh, and someone who grew up in that area, you can understand that um, it's very personal to me, knowing many people who were uh, affected by, um, by mining, by um, the steelworks, and, and who suffered occupational ill health as a result of those areas. And indeed, um, vibration white finger is very common amongst the, a certain generation in my area. And uh, to hear the work that IOM have done in recognising um, what, what vibration can do in, in terms of ill health was um, really interesting this evening. Uh, and I think it's also important because um, it's only through 
um, the work of organisations such as the IOM that um, the effect on women and children and the families of workers is also recognised and that the dangers of asbestos and dust uh, and silica and all these things are taken home, uh, were taken home to, to, to the family at one point and, and that, that, that caused ill health um, to, to the wider community as well. Um, I'm also delighted to be speaking tonight because I'm, I'm the convener of the Cross Party Group on Accident Prevention and Safety Awareness and Occupational Health is something that we have um, held a number of specific meetings from and we go, go back to 2013 I think and we had a presentation um, from Andrew Watterson from the University of Stirling and their Centre for Public Health and Population Health Research. Um, which was absolutely fascinating and, and it takes us back to why the IOM was so important at the time of its inception because in 1875 the first case of paraffin cancer in, the, in Great Britain was described by a Professor Bell and it was um, from people working in the Scottish shale oil plants. And this is incredible because um, the, the article in which it's reported says it was a well-known fact among the local physicians. And I think that's something that we forget culturally miners and steel workers and the people affected by um, occupational ill health um, will have known dozens of people who were affected over the years and yet it took so long for action to be taken. Indeed, in 1922, uh, there were 19 cases of paraffin cancer in the Scottish industry, but no effective action had been taken between 1875 and 1922. And that is why what, what we are doing today and, and highlighting this is so important. Um, in that um, presentation in 2013, uh, the professor said that 15,764 people had died from cancer that year in Scotland and 10% of the cancer deaths were work related and that's an estimate of 1,576 people that year dying because of their work environment and that is why as Monica Lennon said it is so important that we recognise the work across the world of trade unions and the people that are campaigning for safer work people, workplaces and that every worker understands their right to have information about occupational hygiene so that they can look after their own um, health and um, I'm delighted that we're, we're highlighting that this evening. Um, uh, at that meeting we also discussed about the particular um, issue of welding and how that was coming to the fore as being a potential area. Um, but I just finished presenting officer but saying the 28th of April we have um, Workers Memorial Day each year where we remember people who have not made it home from their workplace. And uh, if I can just hi highlight the Scottish Hazards Group, um, because they campaign not just for the UK or for Scotland, but across the world for work that does not cause physical harm or mental injury or illness, meaningful work enabling development of skill and competence, a work which differentiates but doesn't discriminate uh, and is done with respect and fairness. And absolutely, that access to occupational health and safety information and support is vital going forward. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The last of the open debate contributions is from Annie Wells. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I would too like to thank Gordon MacDonald for bringing this topic to debate. As the case with a lot of members' debates, I always enjoy the opportunity to learn about charities and organisations at a more in-depth level. And this was certainly been the case for the Institute of Occupational Medicine, which prior to this debate, I had not fully comprehended the extent of its work. The Institute of Occupational Medicine, which as we know was founded here in Edinburgh in 1969, is now celebrating its 50th anniversary, has an interesting history. Based on the premise of improving the lives of people all around the world, from people's health and safety at work and at home, it was originally founded as an independent research organisation by the National Coal Board. Its primary purpose at the time was to complete groundbreaking research on lung disease in coal miners. As the scope of its work developed, the IOM's research unearthed that coal mining not only caused the specific disease known as pneumoconiosis, but also to an increased risk of chronic obstructive lung disease a common condition caused by tobacco smoking. It made important advances in understanding how asbestos causes disease, leading to establishment of methods for assessing possible hazards. 
Years later, the IOM remit has broadened to understand a range of occupational health and safety risks, having relaunched a fully independent, self-funded charity in 1990. Its services and areas of exp expertise include Legionnaires risk assessment, helping businesses comply with chemical risk regulation, dust exposure monitoring and noise monitoring. It also carries out research into areas such as UV exposure and outdoor workers, as well as review on air quality, that in turn inform government policy. As well as this vital work, IOM understands that the world has changed a lot in the last 50 years, both positively and negatively. And with that comes new challenges. From 2005, it became a leading player in Europe into collaborative research related to the safety of nano-sized materials, something, as we've heard, that has led to the establishment of Safe Nano, IOM Centre of Excellence. In addition, IOM has not only taken on a broader portfolio of work, its influence across the world has grown. As well as covering the UK and Ireland, it now oversees a number of international projects aimed at improving the environment of thousands of workers. And significantly in 2012, foreseeing the need for expertise to improve working conditions in Asia, it set up its first overseas office in Singapore. Singapore. To finish today, I'd like again to thank Gordon MacDonald for bringing this topic to debate. I'd also like to thank the Institute of Occupational Medicine and its staff for all the work carried out to improve people's health and safety at work, at home and the environment. And I wish them a happy 50th anniversary. Thank you, President Officer. Now call Joe Fitzpatrick to respond to the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank Minister. you, Presiding Officer. And I want to add my congratulations to Gordon MacDonald for securing this date and join Monica Lennon in thanking Gordon for talking about his, his own father's experience. Um, as Annie Wells said, this debate has been an excellent opportunity to raise awareness of the IOM, both amongst members and hopefully wider, wider in, in society as well. The Institute of Occupational Medicine has a proud 50-year record of improving the lives and the health and well-being of a great many people. I'd like to put on record my congratulations to the IOM um, on this milestone and I hope that the next 50 years are equally successful. The IOM's journey um, over the last 50 years reflects the seismic changes we've seen in our industrial landscape as outlined by Gordon MacDonald in his contribution. In 1969, the world was co-powered and many thousands of miners worked in dangerous conditions and ran the poorly understood risks of exposure to harmful substances such as coal dust. The IOM's work enabled a better understanding of the dangers that miners were exposed to, allowing both the health of miners to be better supported and mines to mitigate the risk of exposure, becoming safer places to, to, uh, to work. And it was important that Claire, as Claire Adamson reminded us, that sometimes those hazards um, extended um, into the wider environment and even, uh, even to the home. Since then, our industrial landscape has been transformed. The pits are closed. Much of our he heavy industry has been swept away and new types of work and workplaces have emerged. But the IOM's recent work is a reflection of that change. The move to a largely office-based information-led economy means that our workers face new and different challenges to their health, safety and well-being. Nonetheless, it remains the case that employers have a duty of care to understand what risks there are to the health and safety of our workers and to take appropriate steps to mitigate these. We're facing an ageing workforce um, with people having to work later in life before they can get their pensions. We need to improve our understanding of the risks an older workforce um, and what steps can be taken to keep our workers safe. We're also seeing increases in mental health issues in the workplace. It's important for individuals, organisations and the wider um, economy that we recognise and understand the challenges that present and develop approaches to address these. The IOM has developed expertise in a wide range of areas where work can present hazards to workers and has helped many organisations to take the steps necessary to protect their workers. Scotland is, I think, leading the way in pioneering new technologies in industrial bike te technology, life sciences, in digital technology and in artificial intelligence, in science and engineering and in space technology. 
We aim to make Scotland world-renowned for inventing, designing, developing and manufacturing key products and technology. As Rona Mackay um, outlined, the IOM is an example both of Scotland's world-leading innovation and an important contributor to our understanding of the impacts of that new technologies, new materials and new ways of working impact on the workforce in Scotland and worldwide. I believe that um, every worker is entitled to go to work and return home safe and unharmed by their work or workplace. Here in Scotland, we take worker protection very seriously, collaborating across public, private and trade union bodies. <clears throat> Alexander Stewart talked about some of those collaborations and the Partnership on Health and Safety in Scotland is one such collaboration across the many players in the Scottish occupational health and safety system. It's the envy of other parts of the UK and provides a forum for existing and emerging safety challenges in the modern workplace to be addressed. Scotland punches above its weight in science and research and enjoys a global reputation for our research and innovation. To maintain that, uh, this lead, we need to encourage new scientists, engineers and technologists. Organisations like the IOM need to be able to recruit skilled and qualified scientists and researchers, as well as creating an environment that can attract the best minds from around, around the world. We need to encourage our young people to take up the study of science, technology, engineering and math mathematics or STEM subjects mentioned by, I think, Gordon MacDonald. Our STEM education and training strategy is uh, focused on encouraging and supporting everyone to develop their um, STEM capabilities and skills through uh, concerted action in early years and school education, community learning, colleges, universities, apprenticeships and science centres and festivals. We launched our STEM strategy in 2017. The strategy aims to build Scotland's capacity to deliver excellent STEM learning and to close equity gaps in participation and attainment in STEM. It also aims to inspire young people and adults to study STEM sub subjects and to provide a better connection between STEM education and training and the needs of the labour market in Scotland. In particular, we're working with partners to address the underrepresentation of women in STEM courses and careers to ensure that Scotland's STEM sectors are diverse, equal and prosperous. It's only by attracting the brightest and best into STEM subjects and, and careers that Scotland will continue to be at the cutting edge of science, engineering and technology. As Gordon MacDonald mentioned, the IOM commissioned 50 posters that combine art and science to commemorate their, fifth, their, their, their 50 years of history. This splendid visualisation of the IOM's contribution to science, scientific research and tackling the very real and present hazards in the workplace demonstrate the breadth and depth of the value of the Institute. So I'd encourage everyone to take a look at these in, in the garden lobby tonight, or if, if you can't make that, then I, I know that they're available on the IOM website, so um, log in and, and, and have a look. But, Presiding Officer, 2019 marks the 50th anniversary of the first human being landing on the moon. A remarkable technological achievement, but it's also important to mark the 50th anniversary of achievements closer to home and I'd like to acknowledge what the IOM has given us over the past 50 years. I wish the Institute my very best wishes for the next 50 years. Thank you. That concludes the debate and this meeting is closed.